then yeah so I have four three or four cases and some of them are in the weekend group teaching uh, already there you should all have access if I remember correctly that's fine and one of the cases is here in the public domain and I would suggest we start with the hip case here and um, yeah so you probably or some of you might have gone through the case beforehand if not just open up this case right now on collective minds so you can scroll along and if you have any questions just yeah type them in chat or feel free to just uh, ask them right right away using your microphone i'm just going to open the chat at uh, the the same case here with my daikon viewer so i can actually draw on it which is not possible on the collective minds viewer and so this patient he's uh, yeah 40 something years old and has left-sided hip pain I think there was no trauma and the query was femoral acetabular impingement if I remember correctly it was the case from this week and as you can see this was an arthrogram there was some contamination of the soft tissues here you can clearly see the anterior approach um, that's very common it's not so much a problem then there is not really a T1 fat set rated sequence for some reason so in that this is a private institution that I'm reading. So they have just this T1 here, like at the very most cranial aspect of the hip, probably just to assess for the retroversion of the acetabulum. Not even sure what, what's that, what that should help actually. And then there is a T1 coronal here, but obviously I would prefer to have something like this with fat saturation. I'm not sure why they are doing this, so to, be, to be honest, because this one is PD as well. This one is PD. so. Uh, I'm not really, um, yeah, I don't understand, basically. Okay, so why is this case here today? I think this case shows one important finding that can easily get missed. But um, yeah, so I don't see any questions yet. So let me just start off with uh, how I go through the case or how I went through the case. You should all be seeing my screen, I believe, and you should all hear me well. If any technical issues occur, just uh, yeah, just let me know. So I like the pelvis overview to get an overview also of the other side. Obviously, we can see the pubic symphysis. We can see the sacroiliac joints. And we basically just scroll through here to skim the study for major findings. And what we are looking for is basically bone marrow edema which here we have some artifacts from the vessels, but there might actually be a little bit of bone marrow edema. We'll see later uh, whether we can also correlate this with the PD sequences. And what you can also see is this, uh, although there is an arthrogram, we have this black signal in the joint, which is a known artifact in MR arthrography, where you have an inversion of the signal, especially on the stir sequence, as you can see here. And this is based on the concentration that the gadolinium eventually has inside the joint because there is some a curve like this with signal intensity and concentration and if you are unlucky enough to just get the concentration at a certain level then the signal is very low and you kind of have an inversion and instead of hyper intense signal there is dark or hypo intense signal so that's the reason uh, why on STIR images sometimes you have these black MR orthograms. So this is not hemartrosis or, or anything, this is just a artifact. Now, why could the concentration be uh, not like standardized? Like normally you have, so depending on your institution, you have either like fixed uh, syringes with everything ready to inject so then you should not face issues with the concentration but what can happen if you have a pre-existing effusion for example you will dilute um, so going back to this kind of graph if you dilute your gadolinium if you have a pre-existing effusion you will eventually fall into this area here and then you have yeah you were just unlucky and get this kind of inversion of the signal and there's some studies or descriptions from the early era of MR orthography that are covering this. Um, I'm not gonna 
show up the paper, but it's a very complicated graph. Obviously, this one is just simplified, but it looks a little bit like this. Or I think it's even a little bit more complicated. But um, the idea is basically it's depending on the concentration. Um, other reasons could be if you have to prepare the injection yourself that you are doing it wrong, or if you are using lidocaine or any local anesthetic, if you inject too much of that inside the joint, that might also change the concentration. Or also the iodine, if you do we do it with a fluoroscopy guidance, then you can also alter the concentration there. But most commonly, I think it's pre-existing effusion. Um, and you'll notice, so for, for those of you who do arthrograms, if you inject in a joint and you, you have to, you just put in the needle, right? You don't have the uh, what's it called? The, the syringe already on it, just the needle. Sometimes you get spontaneous reflux of joint effusion outside of your needle before you connect with the, you know, with the syringe. And this can be sometimes also good to release a little bit of the pressure inside the joint, and it's also a good indication to see whether the joint fluid is just normal uh, yellowish or whether it's actually red, hemorrhagic. But uh, this depends a little bit on the, on how you do the hemorrhography or the arthrography procedure itself. Okay, so that's basically all we uh, look at this sequence right now. And then the I think we went through a hip last time as well. And um, with bony structures, they do radial images in that uh, institution, which is good. We can quickly check for the retroversion. So we go on the top, we see that's a tabular version here. So this basically is the first time we have a disruption of the anterior and posterior column of the acetabulum or the roof, basically. So it doesn't look like there is any retroversion. If you were to draw an angle, it would be anteverted, which is normal. So it's not retroverted if we have a focal overcoverage in the anterior part, which then contributes to pincer morphology or pincer type impingement. So this one looks okay. Then we switch to any other sequence. PDFS is fine. So we can see there is a little bit of bone marrow edema there. So this signal on the stir sequence was actually real. On the femoral head, there is no bone marrow edema. And then we check for cam deformity or offset uh, alterations. And the radial images are quite handy for this. And you can see at this anterior superior region, there is some flattening of the offset. It's not very smooth if you compare this to the posterior area here. This is also where this commonly is. And in case you don't do radial imaging, you can use any of your sequences. Basically, just pick one, do a 3D MPR. Even if the resolution is not so good, sometimes you still get the idea of how the head-neck junction actually looks like. And then you just do the orientation in the long axis of the femoral neck, and then you just rotate here. And you might just see whether we can actually get it. So, well, it's it's hard to see because there's a lot of distortion because it's a very small field of view. But sometimes, especially if you have um, two millimeter or three millimeter sequences, this might actually work. But obviously we have a 3D sequence. That's therefore not the case. And how to orientate yourself on radial images uh, how do I know this is anteriorly? Basically, the gluteus maximus, the big muscle, is always on the back. And um, then it's mainly just a question, is this anterior or anterior superior? But um, yeah, you can correlate this with 3D cursors or just look how the... Yeah, I think the 3D cursor is the easiest way to do it. So some, uh, basically most PAC systems have this. And so if you go through here, you can even see here. Now you see the gluteus maximus is now posteriorly. So it's not always at the same level. This is kind of important not to uh, switch around anterior and posterior. So if you go to this, also here is a little bit flattened. This is now, if you look here, up here, this is not purely anteriorly. So this is anterior superiorly. And this section here is more on the anterior portion of the anterior superior. And then obviously we have the do we have a transfer section, a proper one? No, for some reason, maybe this should have gone further down. I'm not sure. Okay, anyways, or maybe it didn't upload it. That's also possible. 
So we have a, a, a mild or a moderate offset um, flattening or like it's not even cam, it's more like the offset is a little bit flat. We have some herniation pits and it's interesting here if you look at the herniation pits, these subchondral or subcortical irregularities here, they get suppressed on the fat saturated sequences but they are the typical location and there is no fluid. So what occasionally can happen with this kind of uh, herniation pits is that these primarily cystic lesions at the femoral neck can transform and get filled up with fatty tissue. So this is not something unheard of and I think this is the case here. Probably long standing several years and at some point the fluid gets replaced by fat. And this is also one of the theories how the um, calcaneous lipoma actually exists. So there was a study that showed in a few patients the temporal evolution of primarily cystic lesions in the calcaneus that then regressed and filled up with fat and presented themselves as a intraosseous lipoma of the calcaneus. But this is probably still uh, under discussion, but just to keep in mind that still this is herniation pits that are just regressing. Okay, so this is basically all for the bony structures. And then the intraarticular findings are important here because first of all, we can maybe show it here quickly. I always check for the ligamentum capitis femoris and it's very thin in this case. So the first thing we also notice that the fovea is very flat. So there is even hardly any fovea. And if I would have to point out where the fovea is, it's probably this area here where the cor cortex. So here cortex is good Then we have this irregularity. This is probably the fovea with some irregularities there. And then it's again normal uh, femoral head. So very shallow fovea and the ligamentum, we can see a little bit here. Um, not quite sure what's happening here. It's high signal, but it seems to be in continuation. And because on the other side, it looks quite similar, although it might actually be a little bit thicker. Um, with the inversion of the contrast, we cannot really make a call here on this term sequence but it looks very thin and I would probably just describe this as a thin ligamentum capitis femoris and not try to make out whether this is now a partial tear or or anything else. So if we look maybe on this one, there is certainly, so the ligament comes up here, it goes here and then it's still inserting in this shallow groove. But um, yeah, I would not go the route and say this is some old injury or something. I would just describe this in the description of the report as some thinned ligament. And yeah, that's basically that. So then the next thing would be labrum. And with regards to labrum, I always start on the sagittal, go to the medial side, iliopsoas tendon here, then scroll laterally and so iliopsoas tendon. And then there is typically where we see this high linear signals at the base. So this is a, a tear of the labrum anterior superiorly. And if we go higher up here in this more superior region of the anterior superior quadrant here, it doesn't look too bad. Um, although maybe the cartilage, let's have a look whether the cartilage has any issues there. Technically, it might be a little bit thinned down here. We can try to correlate this with the radial images. So let, maybe let's let's just finish the labrum first. So we have some linear change here. So at the base, and then this is the labrum here. Then we have this transition of labrum to the cartilage. So the contralabral junction here about at this level. And then here again, this is labrum and then some partial volume stuff and then change to the chondral uh, tissue here. So there is no separation at this level, control separation. And sometimes if you see very irregular signal change or like a lot of high point tense signal here at this level, it could be consistent with control label degeneration. And now let's have a look at this cartilage here. So the cartilage of the, of the femoral head goes around this. So it seems it seems quite uh, homogeneous. Uh, at, at some point it will fade out here uh, more in this region. 
and the cartilage of the acetabulum obviously here's the labrum but it should be thick and then slowly thin out a little bit and it might actually be that here with this black stuff that there might be some mild thinning of the cartilage on the acetabular side here it looks a little bit like there should be more cartilage and now let's try to see this on the on the radial images because we don't have so many partial volumes so we can just use the 3d caliper to go to go there so let's see whether we have the same impression here this is again the tear of the labrum here and then here there is no focal defect um, but you can see the cartilage here is way thicker and this is now at this level more like if you would use the, the clock system this would be more about it a, depending on how you use it so either three is always anteriorly or the, or this would be nine o'clock there are the two different systems so if we go to this one here it would be either 11 or uh, 9 10 3 or, or it would be one depending on which clock you are using so there and then at the more two o'clock position or here at this level there might be some thinning here and the bone marrow edema is also a little bit at this area here, as you can see here. So there might actually be some stuff happening there. Okay. So, and now on the femoral side, this is now where stuff gets interesting. Did any one of you spot chondral damage at the femoral side? Just type in text or feel free to just... Uh, jump in and let me know if anything and where you think there might have been something. And I suggest you really open the case on your own uh, PC right now and try to find it in case you didn't do this beforehand. I just don't, I don't, so let, let me put it this way. There is cartilage damage, okay? So it's just a matter of finding it. And it's a, it's a tricky one. I'll just give you maybe a minute or so. I would think so that you are re referencing to this image here. Okay, yeah, I think this one, it, this is already, I think it's the right spot. We will see, we can correlate this with the other sequences as well. And um, because you see how this just around image one and 12, it's not nicely going around. So it flips around, which makes this exact location not so easy to see on the radial images unfortunately but we can let's let's have a look for example at this image here it's a good one so okay so we scroll through we check typically for cartilage damage and stuff and what you can now see here there's a little bit more fluid here between the acetabulum and the head this is something we should uh, be worried about or at least recognize uh, sometimes obviously if it's very central you have the fovea uh, the fossa acetabuli where you get more fluid this is could be normal but if you see something like this just make the correlation with your other sequences and for example we can take this one so we see this there's a little bit more fluid we see the fovea here these irregularities in the subchondral or subcortical bone or of the bone rather and if we come from anterior to posterior, if you look at the cartilage here, very nice and thick. And now there seems to be, if this is coming through, a step off. And then there seems to be some cartilage missing. It's also not so nicely seen on this one here. So maybe we need the other sequences as well. This one is even worse. And on this one, we can't really see it. So we are basically left with, with the with this one here and uh, this would be image number 10 so you can see how you have this cliff off here here so there is a pretty large cartilage defect inside the inside the joint so it's not at the level where we normally have osteoarthritis and stuff it's basically a paraphobial cartilage defect so it's a little bit higher up and I thought there was a sequence that showed it even a little bit better. Let me just try to find it. Uh, 
Yeah, I think this one shows it quite nicely. There might even be some delaminations happening at the borders of the of this defect here. And you could technically measure this and well I, I think I even did I mean, two planes. I think it was 14 and 15 milli millimeters. So something like this. So this is a parafoveal cartilage defect. So this one here, this is just partial volume. This is not the missing piece of cartilage. Um, so we have to be mindful about that. Uh, most likely this cart cartilage fragment has resorbed or I don't know, maybe got smashed down into multiple small pieces. And um, certainly we should check for it, but uh, I, I think I didn't see any anywhere a cartilage fragment of that size, certainly not. Okay, so this is um, a region that's frequently forgotten, parafoveal cartilage defects, and they can, for example, happen if you have a direct impact trauma from the side, for example, like uh, ice hockey body check, uh, as I've seen those in ice hockey players, and sometimes you can really get some delaminations and stuff here. What's really nice is if you do MR traction arthrograms. So if you pull on the leg during the scan and you can manage to open up the hip joint by a few millimeters, those are easier to see, um, as you can imagine. But this is hardly ever done outside of you know, a few centers. I think Balgris does it, a few in, I think, uh, yeah, in Switzerland, a few are doing it. It has some benefit, but it's also a little bit um, more work for the technicians and stuff so yeah okay so this one here is kind of like the trigger so this is a supero posteromedial parafoveal cartilage defect of about 14 by 14 millimeters okay so this is uh, shows again why the radial sequences are quite handy because we have less partial volume and even here, there's this high signal below the cartilage, so there might be some delamination also going on at this level here, but this is not so easy to see. Okay, um, yeah, any questions regarding this cartilage defect? As I would continue with the case, so that was everything inside the joint, I believe, and we would then go to the paraarticular soft tissues, and here, you can start off by this sequence here, so sacroiliac joints are fine, no bone edema, no effusion, no capsulitis, the ligamentous portion is good, we don't see osteochondrosis, maybe maybe there's a little bit of osteochondrosis with modic 1 changes, L5, S1 on the right side, which is probably not relevant since he's got pain on the left side, then pubic symphysis was normal, no secondary cleft sign, no bone redema, no osteitis pubis, then we cannot really check for inguinal hernias in this patient because they don't have, or maybe on this sequence here, but we don't see any, at least not any major hernia. Then muscle edema is a big topic, muscle asymmetry or symmetry rather, um, nothing really is jumping our heads. We, there's a little bit of irritation here around the gluteus minimus tendon, which seems to be, let's have a look on the other side, a little bit maybe more pronounced than on the right side. So I might actually write there is some irritation at the insertion of the gluteus minimus tendon, um, maybe even with some bone marrow edema here, as you can see this error here, which quickly have to correlate this with some other sequences here. It's not very bright though, um, but also we have some issues with fat saturation down here, so this is maybe also some of it technical. And the edema itself is also not very strong, but if you were to window this a little bit more aggressive, you can kind of see how there is some irritation happening there and the tendon might even be a little bit thickened. So what we then want to see maybe on the T1, um, whether we have signs of tendinosis. And the muscle itself looks quite nice, the myotendinous junction also. It's kind of broad, maybe thickened a little bit, 
what I would like to have is a transfer section actually to really be more convinced or more sure that this is real tendinosis and we have here on the radial images obviously we can see it a little bit but this is basically close to a coronal view uh, let's see whether we get something like an axial view but obviously not really because the sections go through this we will not have an axial through that so that's no point looking there and the MPR function doesn't really provide us with the resolution that we need but yeah no it's not really helpful okay so maybe and with that age he could have or could start getting tendinosis there that's not unheard of but it's not a major finding so he has this uh, of uh, this kind of herniation pit so he had some kind of probably impingement in the past he has cartilage damage that's relevant um, maybe he has some inflammation I don't really know how long these cartilage damages are there already. Maybe he had this for quite some time and then some synovitis and stuff happening. Maybe that was also the reason why he had actually some effusion and then secondarily this dilution of the gadolinium resulting in this artifact here with the inversion in the first place. Okay, then the other abductor tendons, the lateral portion here it's probably still within normal limits it's uh, a little bit not black but also not like really thick or anything the muscle comes down nicely here this is a nice coverage here of everything that's good and also we don't see any fatty infiltration of the muscles as far as we can tell and on this sequence here also there doesn't seem to be any irritation there there's just this more around the minimus, a very tendinous irritation. There is no evidence of greater trochanteric bursitis or any other uh, glutamine or glutamidious bursitis also on the other side. There is also what we should always check with hips is iliopsoas bursitis, which is also not the case here. So this one here is uh, the, from the injection. So this is just the soft tissue contamination from the arthrogram. Um, Although it has quite a, let me just double check here. It goes along the iliopsoas tendon, but let's see, do we have a transverse? So this is a T1, which means this one, it's probably still contrast. So then let's see this one. Yeah, the, we have all these artifacts here, which is hard to say. So this one is certainly the injection side. If we follow it down, we come straight down to the middle of the neck. So this is where they injected and some soft tissue contamination in the rectus femoris. So this one, it's not this one. So we have to go more laterally. So this is that in the muscle here or iliopsoas rather and rectus. And then this one here along the iliopsoas tendon is most likely fluid in the iliopsoas bursa actually. But since this is Pride on T1 as well. We can just double check here with the 3D cursor, and you can see here on the lower image how this matches with this fluid up here, which now means we have fluid and contrast in the bursa, uh, ilopsoas bursa. And just here, this is part of the bursa, it goes below the ilopsoas tendon, something like this. And if you have hip pathology, uh, there can be or even a norm, as a normal variant in about 10 to 15 percent of patients they can have a communication of the ellipsoas bursa with the joint so if you inject gadolinium and you have a communication the joint fluid or the gadolinium can also go in here so and then this would basically now be difficult for us to say whether there is bursitis or not but i typically tend to write in the reports there is contrast in the ellipsoas bursa which can um, which indicates a communication of the bursa with the hip joint which can be present in about up to 15 percent of cases something like that and i normally do not provide differential for this being bursitis now technically or in theory he could still have bursitis and communication with the joint and we would still get the same image however oh here you can see the bursa nicely there um, so then it, it depends a little bit on what else do we see so 
we can now quickly check this is all t1 and we can use the 3d cursor again you see here 3d cursor how this is all gadolinium on the t1 coronal here yeah so i'm a little bit on the fence the amount of fluid is a little bit much maybe i'm put down in the i don't actually remember the or there was no clinical information with regards to when he has hip hip pain whether it is in flexion or not but sometimes if i'm not sure if gadolinium goes in i say in the conclusion that there is fluid and contrast in the pursa indicating this communication that i already mentioned up to in up to uh, normally up to 15 percent however it might also be uh, or we cannot really exclude an iliopsoas bursitis and the clinical correlation is necessary. Although we try to avoid this clinical correlation sentence as much as possible in cases when you actually have gadolinium inside, then it's difficult for us to say. Let's assume there would not be gadolinium in here, then this would be a clear iliopsoas bursitis. So if you see something like this along the iliopsoas tendon, uh, below it, sometimes even on both sides, uh, so this kind of lobular structure of the ellipsoas pulsa so here once and then here and the ellipsoas tendon goes down here then this is uh, ellipsoas bursitis and this can be painful it can make groin pain hip pain typically during flexion especially uh, getting out of the car or getting out of the bed when you lift up your leg this is the moment when it hurts so just to uh, show you that Yes, I think that's that's all. Um, I don't have much more for this case. I don't see any questions. Um, yeah, if, just put on your mic or just text anything if you want to want to ask something. Else, we would switch to the next case. So before you move on to the next video, I want you to briefly reflect on how much benefit you get out of my videos here. How much of the stuff that I'm teaching you can you actually apply in clinical routine? If you get something out of it, then you could consider to become a patron of my YouTube channel. Patreon is an online platform where people can support other content creators just like me. You can find the link over here and click there right now. Now, there are other options as well. If you really want to go to your next level in MSK, then you can consider to join the Virtual MSK Radiology Fellowship. You find the link down here and also in the description of this video. The Virtual MSK Fellowship is a one-on-one -on -one case-based teaching program where I help radiologists to get to their next level by increasing their speed and especially confidence in MSK reporting. So go check that one out.